Hello and welcome everybody. Today at Brookings Doha, we are organizing a webinar on the Turkey's regional policy. And as of recent years, Turkey's regional policy has attracted much interest, uh, discussion and controversy at the same time. The nature of the Turkey's foreign policy, the goal of them, the means of it, the methods of it, all of them has been a topic of great discussion, both in the Middle East, in the West and beyond. Today, we have a quite a distinguished list of speakers where we will be discussing the uh, Turkish regional policy, Turkish foreign policy to, towards the MENA region. And for this discussion, we'll be having uh, perspective both from the region and from Turkey as well too. And actually, I will be first starting with the, uh, with the uh, regional perspective and then come to, the, uh, come to Turkey's perspective as well too. But before we go into the discussion, just like you know, a few notes on the housekeeping. Uh, please, for the Arabic, uh, for, for the one that would like to uh, follow our debate in Arabic, use the French language option. Uh, use the French language option because since there is no Arabic option uh, in, uh, on Zoom, we'll be using the French language option for the Arabic. And for whoever wants to pose the question, Q&A, uh, if you want to have like any question, please pose it to the chat box. We'll be uh, I will be uh, collecting the questions after the, uh, after the speaker's initial remarks, and then we'll pose the okay. questions accordingly. We will be also, we will be also having the, uh, we'll be also, you can also pose your question in uh, Arabic as well too, and that will be translated and sent to us. So without further ado, without further uh, ado, I would like to actually start the discussion with Tariq Megrisi, uh, since Libya, as of recently, Libya has uh, dominated the international agenda, but also particularly the Turkish foreign policy agenda as well too. Uh, the Turkish intervention in Libya has been, uh, to a great extent, a game changer. Turkey and Russia, but for, uh, UAE, and uh, there are like multiple actors that are very much shaping the conflict dynamics in Libya. So I would like to start with Tarek and pose him the following questions. Tarek, how the Turkey's uh, Libya policy or Turkey's intervention in Libya has shaped the conflict dynamics? And when you look from here to the future, what kind of challenges, uh, challenges do you think that Turkey will be experiencing and facing? Please limit I, your re remarks to five minutes. I'll try my very best, but these are big <laughs> questions, you know. <laughs> true, true. Thank you, Khadim, anyway, for, uh, for inviting me and for starting with me as well. It's, it's, it's quite the honor. Um, but yeah, I mean, how is, how is Turkish policy affected the conflict dynamics in Libya? It's, it's completely rearranged them. Um, you know, Turkey formally intervened in Libya from, let's call it, December of last year. And during that time, you know, there was a, a feeling of doom and gloom and, and, and concern for the future. You had forces aligned to Haftar with backing from a range of different countries who were inching closer and closer into central Tripoli. Um, and there was a great fear that, you know, we were about to open the door to years of urban warfare. Um, and then over the last six months, Turkey has effectively undone what it took uh, the UAE, France, uh, other nations maybe six years to build. Um, and I think that shows you the scale of, of, of how Turkey has just completely rearranged the conflict dynamics um, in Libya to the extent that, you know, even the, the opposing force to the government of national accord in Tripoli and, and, and Turkey is no longer even headed by Haftar. Um, you know, the, the military paradigm has flipped completely on its head now. So, you know, Haftar, the Eastern forces are, are fracturing. They're no longer as cohesive or really meaningfully under the banner of, of the Libyan Arab armed forces. You know, it's, it's foreign backers who are holding everything together, uh, who drew the lines in the sand at Sirt and who are installing defensive positions and so on. Whereas in Western Libya now, forces aligned to the government of national accord are becoming increasingly cohesive. And, and this kind of plays into what's coming in the future because the next step, which we already see beginning is uh, attempts at security sector reform, once again, led by Turkey. You know, we've had the first units of, of uh, Libyan recruits to be trained in Turkey 
uh, that's going forward. And this will be a real test, you know, to see whether whether Turkey can keep the ball rolling following the state of war in Western Libya to also be able to win the peace. You know, this is a very crucial part of, of any foreign intervention. It's where the, the, the US fell down in Iraq. It's where uh, the Russians are falling down in Syria. So it, it's no easy feat to see whether Turkey will be able to accomplish this in Western uh, Libya. And then, you know, the kind of ominous storm cloud on the horizon is, is another military endeavor that's coming up around central uh, Libya and the city of Sirt and the airbase of Jufra. And this is largely due to kind of massive failures of, of diplomacy and strategy uh, in the weeks following the fall of, of Haftar. Um, you know, when, when the uh, assault on Tripoli collapsed, we were in a situation whereby the Haftar camp was in complete disarray. Uh, everybody was looking for direction over what to do next. Um, and that direction never really came. You know, uh, the Western world, the United Nations never really stepped in to fill the void and to try to, to redirect the situation. Um, and so tentatively, um, the UAE, Egypt and others started to rebuild their position led by Russia, but then backed up by this proposal from Cairo, which was completely unrealistic, but nevertheless received very strong backing um, from the Europeans who, who applauded it uh, and who tried to, to use it as a platform for further progress. And so we ended up in a situation whereby we're back to a dichotomy in Libya. You know, we have the government of national accord on one side and we have an Eastern entity uh, on the other side. And this has just pushed the conflict onto the next level because, you know, we have more countries involved, countries like Greece, uh, which have only really become involved in Libya because Turkey were involved in the first place. Um, and as we see with how Russia and others are preparing for the next phase of conflict, we could actually end up in a situation whereby the biggest impact that Turkey has had in the long term on the conflict dynamics in Libya is just to push the entire conflict onto another phase and another level entirely. Um, and that is probably, you know, perhaps I should have started on the pessimistic note and ended on the optimistic one, but I hope this sets up the rest of the conversation. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Tariq, just a qu question, one minute question before we go to next speakers. Uh, right now, it seems like, you know, Sirt Jufra lines has become one of the main contentious line. Yeah. Uh, what do you expect uh, to happen there? Do you think like Turkey and GNA will push forward or do you see, uh, do you see a potential Turkish-Russian deal? Uh, and if in, even if this is the case, can it be implemented? Um, yeah, I see this ending in war because, as you quite correctly posed at the end, even if a deal is made, I'm not sure where it gets implemented without a lot of acrimony falling down. Because what the Russians did very quickly after it drew the line and sipped with its jets is to try to defend the oil installations, you know, both the oil fields in the south and the terminals in the east. Um, and so Turkey is either in a position whereby it can encourage the GNA to make peace, to freeze the conflict along these lines, and it will have zero control over its revenue streams. Um, and it will retain a threat whereby this opposing force can launch attacks on it from Sirt or from Jofra um, again. And so I think in the long term, both the GNA and Turkey will look to defuse these threats and also to build up their own position of power and strength to be able to project power over the oil installations and also to improve their ability to negotiate both with uh, Eastern Libyan factions, but also with countries like Egypt. Okay. Uh, Marwan, uh, I mean, from Libya to Syria, uh, the next, in a sense, major uh, flashpoints, uh, which Turkey is heavily involved as well uh, too. Uh, the question is like, from your perspective, Turkey's intervention, how it is shaping the conflict in, in, uh, in Syria uh, as well. Uh, and, and for the same question also, what are the challenges that you think the uh, main headache that Turkey will face? And the last point, are Turkey's goals attainable or sustainable? Is Turkey's policy sustainable or its goals attainable in Syria? 
please unmute yourself. Uh, Marwan, can you unmute yourself? Sure, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Ghalib, for um, inviting me, and thanks for um, Brooking Zawha Center for this uh, for inviting me for this timely and important event on Turkish uh, foreign policy. First of all, I think uh, it's very difficult to speak about one Turkish policy towards Syria because, Ghalib, as you know, mm -hmm. Turkish policy on Syria has been evolving uh, since the very beginning of the crisis, from non-interference in in the crisis at the early days into massive military intervention uh, at a later stage. Uh, and in between, I think uh, Turkey played all sorts of roles, starting from mediating between the Syrian regime and the opposition, and trying actually to convince the regime of Bashar al-Assad uh, to accept some sort of a power sharing formula uh, in the early uh, months of the crisis. And then moved to, of course, I mean, into supporting militarily the the Syrian opposition when the conflict turned actually from being mainly peaceful protest against the regime into like uh, armed resistance to the, uh, to the regime. Uh, and also uh, we moved also from um, a policy in which Turkey was almost mainly dependent on the United States in order to do something um, uh, in Syria because Turkey was uh, like hoping for some sort of intervention by the United States, something like, uh, like the Libyan scenario when NATO intervened actually to, uh, to overthrow the regime of Muammar Gaddafi in Libya. So Turkey was also hoping for some sort of intervention by the United States or by NATO in order to, uh, to undermine the regime of, uh, of Bashar al-Assad in Syria. But of course, I mean, that did not work because the Americans were not really inter uh, interested at that time under Barack Obama. Uh, in going into another yet uh, conflict in the Middle East. They were mainly interested in getting out of the Middle East rather by withdrawing from Iraq and then actually by having a deal on the Iran nuclear uh, uh, program. Uh, the dynamic of the conflict in Syria it changed a lot and also Turkish foreign policy on Syria changed accordingly, especially after the Russian intervention and also after the rise of ISIL in Syria. Uh, after the Russian intervention, uh, the question of intervening uh, militarily uh, on the part of Turkey has become extremely difficult without uh, some sort of understanding with the Russians. And that was only possible, in my opinion, uh, just after the failed military coup in Turkey in July 2016. So here when we managed to see the first uh, major military intervention by Turkey uh, in Syria, uh, in five years. I mean, the first military intervention came five years after the beginning of the crisis in 2016. And through the sort of understanding with Russia, I think that uh, Turkey uh, managed to achieve um, uh, one key objective, which is uh, preventing the creation of uh, a Kurdish corridor alongside its borders with, uh, with Syria, starting from, uh, uh, from Malikiya in the far uh, northeast of Syria and uh, towards Ifrin in the far, uh, in the far northwest. Uh, uh, so I think, uh, as I said, I mean, there has been uh, these changes and shifts in, 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 in Turkish policy towards Syria. How that affected the conflict, I mean, uh, it depends on the sort of intervention by Turkey. Because I said at the very beginning, there was the role of mediation. When that failed, then Turkey actually moved to supporting the Syrian opposition. In the summer of 2015, uh, I think the, 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 uh, the understanding between, between Turkey and Saudi Arabia when uh, King Salman first came to power, I mean, the relationship, of course, I mean, uh, between Turkey and, and Saudi Arabia uh, warmed up at the very early stages of King Salman uh, uh, rule. So uh, that understanding led to um, a massive advance by the Syrian opposition on the ground in the summer of 2015. But then we have seen the Russian intervention um, a few months later. Uh, uh, and then Turkey started to focus more uh, on the Kurdish question rather than focusing on bringing down the regime of Bashar al-Assad. So the sort of uh, uh, impact of Turkish policy on Syria was actually changing according as I said, to the role that Turkey was playing and according to the dynamic of the Syrian conflict as a whole with the many actors actually 
uh, having different uh, uh, also uh, objectives uh, uh, in the in this uh, in this conflict. If I want to speak about the challenges, yes, Sorry. please. Go ahead. No, uh, please. You go challenges, and then I will. Uh, I, let me ask you. Pose you this question, and then you can uh, combine them both. Sure. Like now, Turkey is controlling quite a significant chunk of the area in Syria. Uh, do you see, like five years from now, do you still see that Turkey will be able to uh, continue to control these areas? And particularly, where do you see the future of Turkey in Idlib? Well, this is exactly what I was going to talk when I was, men was mentioning the challenges, actually, okay. because now we don't really know whether the Asatana process actually will survive. We don't really know whether the understanding between Turkey and Russia will endure and for how long. Because um, you see, I mean, Russian uh, Turkish relations are not only uh, dependent on what happens on the ground in Syria, but also we have Libya. And uh, Tarek actually has just been talking about this uh, Turkish uh, uh, Russian relationship in, uh, in, in Libya. And also, it will depend very much on the American elections in November. Uh, this year, because we don't know if Joe Biden is going to win the election, there might be also a shift in policy. Right now, we see that there is some sort of understanding between Turkey and the United States, especially on Idlib. Will that last if Joe Biden actually wins the election? Um, so I think these are the main challenges which are going to face Turkey in the coming weeks and months, depending on the, how the relationship with Russia and the relationship with the United States are going to evolve and develop. So that th these are the two issues that, of course, I mean, there is also Iran, but Iran right now is in a very weak position and very much also seeking to have um, uh, some sort of a Turkish support while actually facing these uh, severe sanctions by the, by the United States. So we, the, the whole issue will be depending on these dynamics uh, in the relationship with Russia, with the United States and with other, with other players in the, Syrian, in the Syrian conflict. And the last question, one minute question, with the HDS, because in Idlib right now, it's still the dominant actor. Uh, do you see more of a confrontation uh, between Turkey and uh, HDS, or do you think that Turkey will pursue a policy of de-radicalization and then uh, incorporating HDS into uh, some administrative and security structure in Idlib? Well, that is another challenge, actually, that Turkey is facing in, in Idlib, and we shouldn't actually move on without, uh, without actually mentioning it. I think uh, Turkey, for the past, actually, uh, three years, at least since the uh, September 2018 uh, 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 agreement uh, with uh, between President Erdogan and President Putin, Turkey has been trying actually to de-radicalize, if you want to use that term, actually, HTS, and try actually to bring them into the political process. They have to an extent succeeded, I mean, in some places, but they have failed uh, in other, in other, in, I mean, in other places. So that is also be depending very much on the dynamic on the ground and also on the dynamics and the relationship with the different with the different actors in the Syrian conflict. Especially thank, you. thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abdullah. Uh, I mean, to Gulf, this is an area that is very much you know uh, discussed vis-a-vis -vis Turkish regional policy. Uh, how do you see how much uh, to what extent does Turkey factor in intra Gulf rivalries, uh, and particularly, you know, being in Kuwait and Kuwait to some extent from outside representing a third way in the Gulf politics. How does the Kuwait see the Turkish role in the Gulf? Uh, particularly, what challenges do you see for this role, or what opportunities do you think that Turkey will have uh, in its policy towards the Gulf? Yeah, thank you, Ghalib, and I'm glad to be part of this panel, a uh, very distinguished panel and the timely uh, topic. I mean, Turkey has emerged. Uh, you cannot discuss Turkey's role in the in our region, in our neighborhood, in the, in the Arabian Gulf region without understanding the Turkish project. Turkey has now emerged as a, a major player, a regional player with a lot of ambition uh, led by President Erdogan to project Turkey as a major player in not only regional politics, but beyond that at the international level. Turkey is playing a major balancing act with the, uh, with the West, with the Americans, uh, uh, with the Russians, with the French, uh, 
uh, and it has ambition. And if I were Turkey, I will do the same thing. But that will uh, will carry on a baggage that uh, other countries in the region will look at Turkey with a lot of uh, dismay, uh, envy, and uh, 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 disgruntled. Uh, uh, the reason is because there is no an Arab project to uh, to help the small countries to uh, to allay their fears or to hedge their bets. So because of that, we are as uh, in the region as Arabs. Uh, between uh, these intersecting uh, projects, the uh, the Iranian, the uh, Israeli, the uh, the, uh, the Turkish, and beyond that, the American and the and the uh, and, and the Russian uh, footprints. Now, uh, with the American now have, uh, having lesser footprints, and if you read the last issues of Foreign Affairs, come uh, come home, America, and what happened to the American century or the American. Uh, the primacy, you will see that other countries in the region, the smaller countries, will always uh, try to search for some kind of hedging and align themselves with uh, regional or with international powers. So Turkey benefits from the lesser footprint, American footprints in the region, but Turkey does not have, I think, the ambition to be a major player in, our, uh, in the Gulf region. Uh, it has more interest probably in Syria, in Iraq, and in Libya now because of oil, and because of also the 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 the, the war of wills. Uh, there are five major countries in in, in the Middle East or MENA region: uh, the uh, the Israeli, uh, Israel, uh, Iran, uh, Turkey, uh, Saudi Arabia, and to a lesser extent maybe the GCC before it was fragmented. Turkey has taken sides in, uh, in the region. Now it is, uh, since 2017, uh, Turkey has emerged as a balancer. And uh, it was really very peculiar and uh, disappointing uh, to see as a scholar of uh, regional politics and uh, US foreign policy, to see that even though the, the Americans have the largest Air Force base outside the United States in al adid uh, with 11,000 strong U.S. Personnel, uh, military personnel and Air Force personnel mainly, why would Qatar uh, ask the Turks to bring their troops and to establish a large uh, base in Doha, in al -Adid? That speaks volume until now. What is the reliability of the regional countries on the United States? Why would the uh, the Qataris asked uh, Turkey to send troops. Uh, so because of that, uh, I think, uh, Turkey now is looked upon by the major powers in our neighborhood, uh, mainly Saudi Arabia and UAE, as a, 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 a spoiler, as a country that has an ambition, as a country that could really spoil the project uh, of Saudi Arabia and UAE. Uh, to be the dominant uh, regional powers in the region and to uh, you know, submit their credentials to the world community, especially to the United States and to, the, uh, uh, to Europe even, and even China and other countries and Russia, that if you need anything done in this, uh, in this neighborhood, you have to come to us uh, and we will deliver. So the Qatar uh, alliance access with uh, Turkey spoils this uh, paradigm uh, that has been concocted uh, to try to give a heavier weight for uh, regional uh, powers. Turkey has also problems that extended to the Ikhwan al-Muslimin, to taking sides with the President Morsi, late President Morsi in Egypt. And that also was in direct conflict uh, with the Egyptian current regime led by Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, with the alliance uh, with, the, so, uh, with the Saudis and with the, uh, with the UAE and uh, along the way, uh, Bahrain. The GCC uh, crisis that broke out, uh, it was very unfortunate. I wrote a book even on, on the GCC crises, uh, mainly uh, uh, focusing on the, on, the, on the 2017 crisis. Here, Turkey became a really an, a nemesis and a major threat to the project in the, uh, in the region. So that also spills over toward anything Turkey will do. Then Turkey came along and took sides in the in, in Syrian war, 
uh, along with the what they call them uh, radicals or, or, or terrorist uh, groups in Syria, now in Idlib. And then to add insult to injury, Turkey jumped in and uh, as Tariq stated uh, correctly, uh, undone uh, years of building up Haftar. And so if, wherever you look at it, Turkey is there to spoil uh, some projects, some countries' uh, ambitions. And this also uh, goes into the Turkish uh, charismatic uh, leadership. And the last episode that we are re reliving it now, and I've been attacked, uh, blasted by the trolls and by the bots uh, in the region for uh, taking sides regarding the uh, transferring of Hagia Sophia, Hagia Sophia um, uh, into a mosque again. And that by itself really flared up in our neighborhood, and it, it's really it's splitting up uh, public view, the strong public view, and now the establishment in the GCC countries have not said a single word. I've been following this for the last few days, and I've been tweeting heavily on this. I even conducted a survey, a poll at, on my uh, Twitter account yesterday for 24 hours. Over 6,500 participated in voting. 91% approve of the transferring uh, the, um, uh, the museum, Sophia, uh, Hagia Sophia, into a mosque. Only 9% uh, disapprove. And that by itself speaks volumes regarding how Turkey is being projected, the controversy of Turkey, and the ambitious role of Turkey. So Turkey will have more enemies. Uh, the media, the Arab media, especially the Gulf media, dominated Al Jazeera uh, with the Turkey and with, uh, whatever, whatever Turkey does is supportive of it. Al Arabiya, Sky News, and uh, the, the, the bots and the trolls are completely uh, blasting Turkey and against it. And they're always bringing up, oh, you're talking about Erdogan. Look, he has uh, normalizing uh, relations with, with Israel, allowing, uh, you know, uh, brothels uh, and what have you to disparage uh, Turkey and Erdogan, but Turkey will continue to be a very controversial issue in the region. Yeah. Regarding Kuwait, we have now a very good relationship for the last couple of years. We send the military and security, and Ministry of Interior personnel, Ministry of Defense to coordinate uh, with Turkey. So I would say that Qatar comes first, Oman comes second. Uh, just a footnote here, Oman, Turkey has sold uh, I was just reading today in uh, Geopolitical Futures, uh, which is a paid uh, you know, security and strategic uh, website. It so, sold the, uh, last year uh, $100 million worth of armament. Uh, and UAE, for, and I was very surprised to find out that uh, Turkey sold UAE about $40 million worth of uh, arms deals. Uh, and Turkey is becoming, and, and that's another thing that probably Turkey would cause a lot of, uh, you know, uh, a, lot, a lot of concerns in, in, in our neighborhood. Turkey is becoming a major uh, builder and, and, uh, of armaments. Uh, now it's the 13th largest uh, uh, country to sell uh, arms. And uh, even today, President Erdogan just a few hours ago stated that Turkey has now $3 billion worth of uh, selling weapons, income from selling weapons, and looking forward to become the fourth largest country to uh, manufacture and sell uh, drones that prove to be very effective in Libya, uh, Bayraqdar, and Anka. Just and they're developing another one. So all of that will cause a lot yeah. of concerns and a lot of uh, you know, uh, uh, unease. Uh, among here, the other uh, camp uh, that is anti-Turkish camp in the region. Absolutely. Just here a question to you. You very uh, one of the one of the important points that you mentioned is basically this fluctuation in U.S. policy, which enable other actors increasing their footprint in uh, in the Gulf. If there is a yeah. new administration, which will once again have more commitment to the Gulf security and try to de-escalate. Uh, between Qatar, Saudi Arabia, UAE. What will this mean for the Turkey's regional presence in the Gulf? And secondly, let's assume in a post Erdogan period, how will the Gulf look at Turkey? Because right now what I see 
to for many in the Gulf, in a sense, the Turkey is very personalized uh, in the in the form of the President Erdogan. So, if there is more U.S. commitment to the Gulf, what does it this mean for uh, Turkey's regional presence? And secondly, if there is another president two or three years from now in Turkey or five years, what how the Gulf will look at Turkey uh, from the other side? A very good question, Galib. Thank you. Um, I think what's going on for since the uh, Bush, the son, uh, created havoc in the region by launching uh, unnecessary wars uh, against uh, Afghanistan and then against Iraq that really destroyed the, 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 the delicate balance of power uh, because Saddam Hussein, with all his, uh, with all his faults, with all his uh, uh, dictatorship rule, was the only balancer to Iran. And since then, Iran has been the hegemonic regional power uh, in the region, and it, uh, gave, that gave Iran more ambitions to be a major player. Even uh, I, I would fault uh, Bush and the neocons uh, for dealing uh, such a blow to our uh, fragile uh, balance uh, of power. Uh, but the Americans, I am writing now as the second volume of my, my book, the, the emergence or the development of president of, of U.S. presidents' doctrines, and um, I'll, 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 I'll be focusing on a separate volume on Trump uh, doctrine, if there is one, which is only withdrawal, withdrawal, withdrawal. It's not an aberration. I mean, Obama started it after the Americans got sick and tired of endless wars, and President Trump even uh, uh, campaigning on ending the endless wars. And because of that, he's talking about withdrawal, and that creates more anxiety and more, uh, what I call it, trust deficit between the US allies, even Turkey. Uh, and especially the Gulf countries and the United States. It's not going to be an aberration. It's not going to be Obama and Trump who will have less footprint uh, uh, in the region, in the Middle East and MENA region. It's going to be a, a continuation of this policy. And even uh, you have to remember that Biden, if he wins, which will, if elections will take place today, I think Trump will lose very badly and he will be humiliated. Uh, very badly because if everything is doing everything he touches it, it, it becomes uh, you know crisis uh, if biden comes don't put a lot of hopes on biden because it's going to be a continuation of obama who was hands off who did not attack Assad when when he had the chance to do it after al ghuta uh, uh, criminal attack by al assad regime uh, killing 1400 people gassing them to death uh, and he was his hand was on the trigger, but he he chickened out and he didn't pull the trigger, and that would could really have we could have different dynamics at that time. So Biden will not really commit more troops because American the Americans because I understand American psyche. I I, I studied I lived there for the, the last four years. They're sick and tired of wars and of sending their troops and of uh, uh, killing their troops in from Afghanistan to Iraq to Syria to the region. He is not going to be much different than the style will be different, but the Americans will continue to will continue to have lesser footprints, lesser commitments, will be more, more inward looking, and maybe it's not going to be America first, but it's going to be America with more multilateralism, not isolationism and sanctions and unilateralism and populism that has propagated and really put America in a very very bad situation uh, it's it's image it's it's uh, it's a uh, projection of power nobody now trusts the united I states from, uh, on the driver's seat i mean sure. i mean it's nice is looked upon as a cause for instability rather than the leadership sure. that really sure. will be uh, on, on the front lines to tackle all the crises where is the united states when uh, with, with covid 19. it's the worst sure. country in the world you have 138,000 dead Sure. And 2.5 million uh, cases. Sure. So because of that, Turkey, Iran, Israel will have a field day, whether Trump wins again, which is hard to, to believe at this stage, it's going to be a miracle, or if Biden comes with lesser commitment, Thank you will have the Chinese now. You have to do a, a session. I was reading yesterday in the New York Times, the new 25-year uh, strategic deal between Iran and China. This is going to be a game changer. 
So really China will be, So the China is the new major player in the town. Uh, from here, I will go to right now to perspective from uh, Turkey. Actually, uh, first I will go to Ankara and ask uh, Dr. Taha Ersan. Uh, so when you look from Ankara, uh, the Turkey's regional policy of recent three four years, what do you see as the major drivers of these policies? And particularly when you look at the Syria, Eastern Mediterranean, Libya, if there was a different government in place in Turkey, would that mean a radically different policies on these files? Or would this mean that like, you know, Turkey would have more or less still the same policy? Uh, thank you, Galip. And thank you, former speakers uh, who spoke before me and the ones that are going to speak after me and the Brookings uh, Doha Center organizing this uh, webinar. Uh, the question is interesting one. Uh, will Turkish foreign policy will be different under a, a different government? I don't have exact answer. The answer is no and yes. No, because main assumptions, premises, and the base of Turkish foreign policy as we know it uh, would not allow a different government to produce entirely different uh, roadmaps, at least. The main reason is that in a foreseeable future, no one expects a dramatically different government, first of all. Uh, even if Erdogan government will be changed in election, uh, one should expect a similar foreign policy uh, line regarding Middle East, North Africa, and Eastern Mediterranean. Yes, uh, to answer your question, uh, there might be a radical shift in some areas, vis-a-vis uh, -vis especially Russia and subsequently with West and especially uh, United States. I mean, the change in Russian foreign, uh, the, the change in Russian policy in Turkey directly will affect itself and uh, manifest itself in uh, relation with West and the uh, United States. Uh, what is called, I mean, Turkish foreign policy uh, has been and will be continue uh, Turkish foreign, uh, Turkish domestic policy in many senses. Uh, it is uh, too much overlapped currently, and it's not easy to discern uh, between two. Uh, even the issues may seem directly contradicting with Turkish domestic consumption uh, are somehow being managed first domestically within Turkey before declaring it as a foreign policy with all kinds of different uh, dynamics. Uh, for example, uh, pick up uh, Russia. Uh, Russia, who is categorically and historically Turkish, the other, even in many cases enemy, first managed by government within Turkey as an ally, then relations improved, then we had such a very interesting uh, alliance. Uh, while we are having entirely different foreign policy uh, directions. Uh, Erdogan's domestic support being used as an insurance policy in that process for the public's concerns on Russia. Then Ankara and Moscow started their relations to be advanced. Uh, second, uh, since the Cyprus war in 1970s, 1974, Ankara's proactive military and foreign policy attempts have silenced mostly until uh, early 2000s. Uh, expect uh, uh, just a one exception, maybe. In 1999, uh, Turkey openly threatened Syria with military operation, cross-border operation, but that never been materialized. Uh, so, so far, uh, Turkey was having a, some kind of silenced period until uh, early 2000s. And for sure, there were some instances of foreign policy making, but in general, mostly they were uh, rather foreign relations and diplomatic uh, relations. And it was only early 2000s when uh, started to witness a comprehensive foreign policy approach. And you will see when I, if I list uh, just some developments yearly, uh, it's quite easy to see how different those early 2000s and uh, forth on when you compare to the uh, rest of the uh, early century. Uh, 
Uh, in 2003, for example, Turkey rejected US occupation in Iraq, and it was a very bold move, and it created a huge debate and price for Turkey. In 2004, there was a very successful and very powerful push for EU membership. That changed country dramatically and relations with the West dramatically. In 2005, full force of involvement of Turkish foreign policy uh, and institutions in US occupied uh, Iraq uh, elections. And in 2006, uh, a very proactive uh, step came from Turkey. Uh, they started to involve Palestinian issue by accepting election winner Hamas in, 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 in Ankara, although there was a huge rejection and protest uh, from Washington and, and, and Israel. In 2007, uh, military in Turkey involved in Turkish presidential elections and judiciary attempted to shut down governing uh, party, ruling party. And that period uh, uh, started an uh, absent uh, year. And you literally see Turkish foreign policy muted during that, that period. But as soon as uh, domestic polit politics managed by the government, uh, the foreign policy developments uh, accelerated again. In 2008, Turkey became UN Security Council uh, with a record vote from uh, throughout the world. In 2009, Turkey was uh, mediating between Israel and Syria. And in 2010, there was an Iranian nuclear deal uh, entirely invented by Turkey with very proactive involvement. And Turkish-Israeli relations had a huge crisis and it started to derail. Then Arab Spring and so on. We don't need to get every year. But if you check all these critical developments, you could see and you could easily notice that proactive Turkish foreign policy uh, was there and it was playing a very vital role. And this was due to having a vision within country which manifested itself uh, at abroad as a foreign policy as well. That vision started to dissolve as Turkish domestic uh, politics uh, having uh, their own, own, own uh, problems and they started to have uh, pro having a problem of pr producing a creating uh, vision, uh, cre creative vision. Uh, when the vision started to raveling, uh, Turkish foreign policy started to uh, change at least its tracks. And currently what we are witnessing is raveling of uh, that, 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 that vision. And thirdly, while Turkish domestic and foreign policy vision was raveling, uh, global and regional developments also uh, played a very huge and very negative role in this, uh, uh, this uh, dissolvement of the vision. Uh, mainly Obama administration's indecisiveness and pro status quo approach to the Middle East, North Africa, uh, and Europe also uh, did not help in that sense. Uh, and those things had direct impact on Turkish foreign policy. Uh, Obama's stance on Arab Spring, especially the Syria, uh, it was full flip-flop. As a result, Egypt to Syria, uh, the hopes uh, derailed and Turkey uh, directly affected from that uh, position. As the region started to transform rapidly, Turkish foreign policy literally ended her uh, visionary approach, lost its operational uh, policy tools. The outcome was securitization of the policy as expected. Since uh, 2014, Turkish foreign policy only acts proactively if she could act militarily. Uh, especially after 2016 uh, coup attempt, Turkish domestic politics literally turned upside down uh, and this uh, created a very uh, problematic and primitive nationalist discourse and everything happening uh, within this atmosphere right now, uh, the, this nationalist narrative was quite suitable and useful for the current uh, securitization of Turkish Turkish foreign policy. A and question. It, was a, uh, it was a reflection of domestic atmosphere to Turkish, Turkish foreign policy. Since then, the, there is a Turkish foreign policy within the strict limits of Turkish domestic policy. I mean, if anything happens in uh, foreign policy, 
it must either have uh, domestic uh, usage or in uh, short term, uh, current government must be uh, using it domestically. If it's not useful domestically, you wouldn't see any vision or any operational moves within Turkish, Turkish foreign policy. As long as military involvement exists, uh, I am finishing up, uh, Galip. Uh, current domestic atmosphere uh, would support so-called Turkish foreign policy in Syria, Libya, uh, or uh, in Iraq. With a different government, there is a possibility of dealing foreign policy as a, uh, uh, yes, there might be, uh, but that could uh, only show itself on a single issue, which is directly related to each other. Either there will be a dramatic change starting with uh, towards Russia, or there will be a dramatic change starting towards uh, Washington. Any of them uh, will uh, create its logical result as their uh, relations will dramatically change with Russia and, and Washington. And for that, we need to see uh, November elections. Uh, it may uh, be a big change within Turkish foreign policy. Uh, and we will see it will have also some domestic implications within uh, Turkish domestic politics. And that strange relationship, domestic and foreign, is a very interesting one. I, let me finish with them just uh, quick examples. Uh, for example, Sisi is, I mean, this is a legitimate question. The Sisi or Egypt issue is a foreign policy issue or domestic one? If you live in Turkey, it's not easy to answer. I mean, uh, currently, both Egyptian issue and the developments in Egypt or the Sisi, what he does, is mostly consumed domestically. Or an ordinary guy who cannot even point uh, Libya on the map he, he could talk about Khalifa Haftar, how bad he is, how Satan he is. And, uh, or uh, as 400 missile systems. Uh, it's a very domestic issue. I mean, it's being consumed by uh, anyone in Turkey. I mean, regardless of their profession, regardless of their uh, intellectual interest. So this linkage between domestic and foreign policy usually happens when governments uh, lose their visionary politics, constructive politics, and uh, it needs an insurance policy to continue to uh, pursue such a uh, line. And that insurance policy is nationalistic atmosphere, and it is there. And as long as it continues, uh, even the government changes, uh, we will see in a short term uh, this line uh, to, be, to be preserved. Uh, in a one minute question, uh, if you, when you project two or three years from now with Russia, do you see uh, the current cooperative relation with Russia to continue in the Middle East? Or do you see actually this will gradually fall apart? I mean, for me, I have been writing, I mean, several times on this issue. That relationship is, uh, it needs to be named uh, rightly. Uh, it is a very fragile tactical relationship. I mean, it's fragile because it uh, lacks uh, any essence and structural links. What does it mean? It means uh, regionally, Turkey and Russia come face to face on several issues. There is not a single one where Russian and Turkish position not overwhelmingly, but modestly overlapping or they are in line or we can trust their co collaboration, such as from Georgia issue to Ukraine, from Eastern Mediterranean to Libya, from uh, Syria to Israel. Entirely different approaches, not only approaches, entirely different interests. Plus, I just said in my uh, opening remarks, uh, Russia is a uh, Turkish other in an identity, historical identity imagination. And same thing true for Russia. I mean, for Russians, uh, Turks are the historical other, if not the enemy today, but it could easily cross that line. So the first thing is 
creating that fragility. So it's very fragile. Tactical, as you know, tactical thing comes with the affiliate alliances. Uh, no one can predict how long that tactical uh, collaboration could survive. And Syria was the best example. We don't need to uh, mm -hmm. get into detail and repeat what everybody knows already very well. So that gives us uh, any prediction on uh, Russian-Turkish relations for midterm uh, that will continue and pursue and pursue in this line and survive uh, would be uh, uh, would be mistaken. I mean, it could easily became like February 27 night where Russia attacks directly Turkish soldiers and uh, close to 50 of them being killed. And, or in Libya right now. Anything could happen anytime. So uh, I rather wanna be what critical and I rather be wanna uh, careful. That's why that relationship from uh, two, three years from now uh, cannot be, uh, or we can see entirely different thing. And domestic uh, atmosphere is ready for it. I mean, with Erdogan's insurance policy, Russia is a friend. Uh, again, same Erdogan could come up and uh, could tell uh, masses that how Russia is a big threat and the enemy, people would say, yes, you're right, sir. And by the way, polls uh, are confirming it. Uh, Russia is uh, one day is one of the best uh, ally. Next day, if you do, a, actually we did, in March, you do a poll and you ask about Russia, uh, the biggest enemy. Just a month ago, Russia was an ally in the public opinion. Sure. So this gives you, this is not a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. This is tactical and this cannot sustain easily in short term, uh, regardless of sure. talking about midterm. Sure. Fuat Hocam, uh, I mean, Turkey's Middle East policy is taking place with a broader foreign policy framework. So what does Turkey's Middle East policy tell us about the overall Turkey's foreign policy uh, orientation? And going forward, uh, basically, what do you anticipate? What kind of challenges do you anticipate that Turkey will experience in its regional policy? Thank you, Galip. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you for uh, Brookings Law for providing me with an opportunity to be part of this uh, distinguished panel and to listen to my previous uh, friends. I agree with, uh, to a large, large extent, uh, most of the things that they have uh, said uh, about uh, Turkish foreign policy, uh, you know, uh, the changes in it uh, and also uh, challenges uh, uh, to it. Uh, what I can do as an answer to your question, maybe, uh, you know, talk about uh, what I see uh, four significant or, or radical uh, shifts in uh, Turkish foreign policy from uh, 2002 to the present, especially last uh, uh, five years, uh, in which uh, we've been uh, seeing an emergence of a new Turkish foreign policy strategy which is different from the uh, you know the sort of uh, past uh, ten years, uh, and uh, and these uh, four shifts uh, of course uh, have uh, given uh, some uh, capacity uh, and ambition, as my friend Dr. Abdullah said. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, each shift, uh, I will say in a second, uh, uh, have <coughs> has come with a big cost. Turkey have lost maybe more than it has gained because of these uh, shifts. The larger shift from 2002, 2010, the beginning of Arab Spring and then and, and the beginning of the Syrian conflict and today last five years has been the, the, the one that actually started the, the, the end of soft power based uh, proactivism and, and at the beginning or to do hard power based, uh, what I call uh, selective uh, proactivism. And, and, and uh, Turkish foreign policy during the first decade of, 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 of the 21st century was based on soft power based uh, proactivism, which worked on uh, two basic uh, pillars. One actually Turkey being a trading state with uh, trade diversification and, and uh, playing an important role in global economy. And then second, Turkey being a beacon or model or, or, or an important, uh, you know, <clears throat> experience to be learned from 
in terms of how Islam and democracy and modernity can live together. And, and actually uh, through, through that kind of uh, modality, you know, peace and stability can be established uh, in, in the region, in Middle East or, or, or many. Uh, Turkey plays a mediating role. But last five years, uh, Turkey has, uh, you know, s sort of shifted towards what I call hard power based uh, military oriented selective proactivism uh, through military offensives in Syria and, 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 and Libya. But also, as, 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 as Dr. Abdullah said, uh, you know, the establishment of the military bases in, in different, uh, you know, the sort of countries, Qatar one, you know, the Somali and, and you know, now then Libya and, 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 and Syria. So, so in this sense, uh, of course, uh, Turkey's uh, hard power military based uh, selective proactivism, you know, maybe made Turkey a major uh, player uh, in, in, in these uh, countries. But on the other hand, uh, Turkey has, uh, you know, lost to two very significant, uh, you know, foreign policy pillars: a trading state and 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 uh, being a beacon. And and most both of them actually are very very important for for regional uh, regional stability. The second uh, shift, uh, which actually follows the first one, is uh, is actually Turkish shift from Turkish foreign policy acting within the institutional arrangements like European Union, NATO, transatlantic alliance, to uh, Turkish foreign policy, you know, acting uh, through uh, what I call flexible alliances. And so from uh, institutional multilateral type of foreign policy agenda, we have actually seen the emergence of the importance or, or, or you know, uh, the, the effectivity of alliance politics, especially, for instance, in the Syrian case, Sochi-Astana process and alliances between Turkey, Russia and, and Iran to solve the, uh, solve the uh, Syrian policy. And similarly, the Libya case, actually, again, you know, it is not a, you know, sort of institutional through institutional arrangements or, or multilateralism, but of, of course, it's a selective, you know, alliance policy in, in, in Turkey and very, very much, much military, military or, 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 or oriented. And as a matter of fact, the recent government actually has preferred uh, institution, you know, the alliances over, over institutional arrangements, which actually weakened Turkey's place and role and attachment to NATO, EU, and, and the other kind of, you know, institutional, uh, global, 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 global institutions. The third shift was uh, actually a shift from, uh, from uh, you know, Turkey sort of three, creating a balance between security, economy, and democracy to Turkey's choice to prioritize security over, over democracy. And as a matter of fact, uh, you know, when you look at the recent Turkey's uh, foreign policy based on military offensive in Syria and Libya, they are all actually uh, justified on the basis of uh, securitizing uh, Turkey's place in, in the region, sort of uh, based on a national security agenda that prioritize state security and territorial integrity. And as uh, my friend Marwan said, for instance, in, in Syria, the main actually issue to Turkey's involvement in Syria was to prevent the Kurdish state or Kurdish corridor, which was actually seen as, as a national, as, as a threat to territorial integrity and national, you know, state security of, 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 of Turkey. And, and in this sense, uh, these shifts actually also created a situation in Turkey where Turkey's uh, you know, historical problem with the Kurdish population or the, what we call the Kurdish problem has become one of the main uh, hampers or, or hurdles or determinants of Turkish foreign policy shifts. Uh, you know, the determining Turkey's foreign policy to Iraq, Turkey's foreign policy to Syria and, 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 and the Middle, Middle East. But uh, number four is very also crucial for me, a shift from uh, Turkey's attachment with, with the West with, with EU, with, with EU anchor, Copenhagen political criteria, so on and so forth, towards uh, Turkey's uh, foreign policy acting on the base of what is called strategic autonomy, uh, you know, Turkey as an independent nation state uh, acting on the sort of searching for its own interest and own actually uh, leverage, so on and so forth. And as a matter of fact, uh, the first three uh, shifts, radical shifts in Turkish foreign, foreign policy 
has really weakened uh, Turkey's relation with the West. As a matter of fact, as uh, Taha said in terms of uh, domestic politics, uh, right now, uh, you know, uh, every example, every move in Turkish foreign policy, but also in domestic policy, has further weakening Turkey's uh, you know, relation with the West. More important, the, Turkey, the, the idea of West in Turkey, idea of Turkey's place in the world, in, 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 in West. And as a matter of fact, uh, you know, uh, Turkey has become uh, kind of anchorless uh, as a result of these, uh, these, these, shifts, these shifts. So this four, from soft power to hard power, from institutional arrangements to alliances, from uh, security slash democracy economy to prioritizing security, and, and for the Turkey's uh, weakening relations with the West or the Turk, the, 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 the weakening of the idea of the West in, in the Turkish foreign policy in, in, in Turkey. I think these are uh, the, the issues that are concerning Turkey, but at the same time concerning uh, our friends in the region too, because I think uh, those shifts are really hampering uh, Turkey's potential to contribute to regional stability and, 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 and you know, the, the possibility of return to normality in, 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 the, in, the, in the Middle Middle East. Every move has gained Turkey some strategic autonomy, uh, but on the other hand, which every move, Turkey has lost very, very important, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, ability or capacity to play a very, you know, role in, in establishing stability and peace in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the region. Right now, we need actually Turkey acting as a trading state, but Turkey's trading state role has finished almost. Uh, and as uh, <coughs> Dr. Abdullah said, and, uh, you know, the more Turkey becomes ambitious in the region, the more Turkey becomes alone in the region because that ambition actually might be perceived as a spoiler for, for the interest or, or the actions of the other, other, other act, actors. As a matter of fact, when I look at the, uh, when I trace the evolution of Turkish foreign policy last, you know, 15 years in terms of, of, of the Middle East, but generally, you know, globally, global, globally speaking, uh, we have seen uh, that, that, that the more ambitious Turkey has become, the more security oriented Turkey has become, the more hard power uh, oriented Turkish foreign policy has become, the more uh, independent, more autonomous maybe Turkey has become, but the weaker, uh, you know, Turkey's, uh, you know, ally, sort of, you know, ties with the West, with the other, other region, even with the, with the, with the Middle East. When we, uh, Taha knows better than I do, but when we, when we compare uh, Turkey's perception in the Middle East between 2002, 2010, and 2016, 2020, present day, uh, we see actually a radical uh, shift or a radical uh, you know, decline from a positive image of Turkey in, in, in the Middle East and, 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 and the Middle East to a very negative image of, 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 of Turkey. So Turkey becomes maybe a key player through military offensives or hard power, but the, but the more ambitious this role is, the more actually uh, alone or the more negative perception of Turkey has, you know, uh, sort of, or increases uh, in, the, in the region too. So, uh, so I, I see actually this, uh, right. this, this shifts and, and that would actually come with a, with a cost. Turkey could have played a more important role in the establishment of stability. In, 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 in the region, but because of these shifts, Turkey has lost the ability and capacity to play this role. But also, the lastly, uh, maybe I should actually add this one, and this is actually a puzzle for us, uh, you know, dealing with or, or discussing Turkish foreign policy in Turkey, uh, and, 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 and trying to understand the relationship or, or the interaction between Turkish foreign policy and Turkish domestic policy. Uh, the puzzle, uh, the, the dilemma is this. For instance, in the Syrian conflict, Turkey had uh, legitimate uh, reasons uh, to actually engage with Syria because we have longer borders, we have refugees, we have security risks and everything. And when actually, so, so Turkey started engaging with Syria and, and there was a support for Turkey's actually 
worries about the failed state situation in Syria, what goes on in Syria, the brutality of the Assad regime in, in Syria. So we supported this, the, the, the Turkey's foreign policy in, in, in Syria. As a matter of fact, we supported the refugees, we supported the, you know, sort of the end of conflict in, in a possible, you know, sort of a, a, a possibility of moving in Syria into a post-conflict uh, situation. So Turkey had legitimate reasons to deal with Syria. But when we actually uh, see Turkish foreign policy and Turkey-Syria relations and its perception of it, not only actually in the West or in the international community, but in actually uh, Middle Middle East, uh, you know, uh, we have a very negative uh, sort of uh, perception. So, so in this sense, Turkey uh, has moved from being right in dealing with uh, Syria to becoming, uh, as maybe uh, <laughs> Dr. Abdullah or, or Mr. Abdullah said, you know, it's a kind of a challenge to Syrian stability. So, so in this sense, uh, this is a puzzle. How is it a country, uh, you know, sort of uh, start something in a sort of legitimate way and then, uh, you know, move into a less legitimate, uh, you know, orientation. Libya is like that too. In the very beginning, uh, you know, uh, we actually said that Turkey is, right in uh, its concern about Libya in terms of France, in terms of, you know, uh, sort of uh, Greece, in terms of European Union and kind of Turkey blocking Turkey or containing Turkey in, in, in its own, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, coast area. But uh, we never seen actually, or we never expected that Turkey uh, legitimate concerns in terms of Libya and the Eastern Mediterranean turns into a Turkey is a major, as uh, our friend Tarek said, major military player in Libya and a major, you know, sort of military actor in the future of, of, of Libya. So oh, these yeah. are the puzzles, uh, you know, that, that uh, I see. Sure. And, I, and I see that the last, uh, you know, sort of five years, every move mm -hmm. that Turkey has made towards hard power, military security issues, and being an ambitious foreign policy, it has come with a very significant cost and, and damaging Turkey's real ability and potential to, play, to, to actually be a real beacon for regional and global stability. Well, Atuja, a question here to you, particularly in recent, uh, in recent months, when it comes to the maritime deal with Libya, uh, the Turkey framed this as part of the Blue Homeland, yeah. uh, this is particularly. And it seems the main proponent or the main supporter of this or the, the main architect of this project was the Turkish Navy. So does that mean there is a much broader uh, coalition or much broader support for Turkey's Libya policy, its Mediterranean policy within the Turkish state within the Turkish government. So therefore, like, you know, a Libya policy, more of a state policy rather than a party politics. A very good question and also a statement, Galip. Uh, you know, uh, for instance, in that context, uh, we actually go back to 2006, you know, where we start talking about East Mediterranean, you know, the, the blue land and every, everything. But of course, when Tahawa is going through, you know, years in terms of the changes in Turkish foreign policy, 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7. So when actually this uh, agenda or this initiative was started, started in 2006, Turkey had very good relations with uh, Egypt, Turkey had very good relations with the, you know, MENA region and everything. So it was not started, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, how we see Libya and Turkey right now. That's what I, I am I'm saying, actually. Something that uh, started in a positive way based on, uh, you know, proactive soft power kind of, kind of, you know, foreign, foreign policy turned out to be a very uh, military offensive type of, actually, uh, foreign, foreign policy. This had uh, two reasons. Actually, one actually has to do with the, uh, as I said, changes in the direction of Turkish foreign policy. But also, as Taha said, in domestically, the more uh, internal domestic uh, politics of Turkey is run by uh, what I call very nationalist, very state-oriented, very security-oriented, you know, governments. Uh, the more uh, Turkish foreign policy also, you know, you know, sort of moved into a more offensive military security-oriented, and actually. Uh, 
uh, if you look at uh, the, the, the development of uh, Turkey's involvement in the East Mediterranean and Libya since 2006 onwards, as Tarek has uh, very much uh, said that, you see a Turkey doing good business, Turkey is able, Turkey being able to talk to all the regional actors uh, in the beginning, but, but right now maybe Turkey is uh, has the ability right now be, to, to rearrange, uh, you know, sort of the structure in Libya, but, but in terms of sustainability, in terms of how actually it's gonna, con it's gonna help the uh, stability of, of sure. Libya, there's a big uh, question mark. Sure. That's, that's what I'm saying, everything yeah. started in a first part of the uh, Turkish foreign mm. policy as soft power has changed right now. So we could actually look at trace the, 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 the you know, the, 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 the transformation of Turkish foreign policy, and not only in terms of global and regional changes, but also domestic changes in, 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 in Turkey. Uh, and, and, uh, and right now, I think uh, Turkey is facing the risk of losing its capacity and potential to be much more, uh, you know, positive, constructive in regional stability, which it was. Uh, you know, with the, you know that is the cost of this uh, hard power military right. uh, foreign policy strategy. Fadijam, there are many questions, so there is like something like twenty questions here, and I got like three, four here, so twenty-four questions and twenty minutes. So that means each of you I will pause. Please, like you know, confine your answers to two minutes. Let me actually just start with you, Fatoja, because there are many questions that are directed uh, to the point of view that you have in speaking. One of them is, is Turkey's, uh, I mean, is Turkey's EU bid has finished? So is Turkey's like, you know, EU membership aspiration has come to an end, particularly when you look at the recent Turkish-French tension in, uh, in Libya, what does that mean for Turkey's, you know, NATO integrity and the Turkish space in NATO first? And the second one is uh, another, uh, another attendee are asking about the, the basically, does Turkey's Kurdish question makes Turkey more and more inward looking? So Fatojan to you, and if you can just like confine to two minutes. Yes, actually, that. just very briefly, the, the, I start with the second one. Uh, I was a member of the Wise People Commission in the, uh, you know, this famous peace process a couple of years ago. And uh, we had the uh, hopes and ambitions to actually, you know, sort of disarm PKK, you know, and, 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 and make this actually a Kurdish question as a political one that can be solved through deliberation. But right now, uh, the Kurdish question domestically and regionally has become actually one of the main hurdles or to the Turkish foreign policy, but at the same time, one of the main uh, determinants of these shifts uh, towards mm -hmm. hard power and, and, and security oriented ones, both foreign policy and, and domestically. But at the same time, uh, I would actually suggest that Turkey should, you know, change its uh, Kurdish foreign, Kurdish, it's, it's actually sort of policy towards uh, Kurds in Turkey and the, and, and the re re region, because, uh, you know, those actually, these are the, main hurdles, uh, not only, you know, sort of suffering Turkey, but hurting Turkey, but at the same time hurting Syria, Iraq, and the other, other Middle Eastern countries. There is a big stalemate in, in the Turkey-EU relations. And, and also like one of the actually reasons why Turkey has been able to actually act uh, as an independent nation state close to Russia and China is to do with the weakness of the West. Western institutions, weakness of the, of the NATO and the EU, but and it's a very mm -hmm. transactional right now. And, sure. uh, uh, you know, uh, we will actually, uh, today there is a, you know, sort of EU foreign, uh, you know, sort of ministers meeting about, about Turkey and Turkey's involvement in Eastern Mediterranean and, and, and Libya. I think one of the big loss uh, in terms of uh, Turkish foreign policy, but also in terms of Middle East and MENA actually is the weakening of the leverage of the EU in actually in, sure. in these areas. And Turkey is the only country in this region which has a very close connection with the Europe, EU, NATO and everything. And I think Turkey's bridge role sh should have not been lost. Uh, and as, you know, so, so in this sense, we start, we always sure. uh, promote, we always work enhancing Turkey-EU relations, at least in terms of anchor ways and everything. But, but nevertheless, uh, right now, uh, there is a significant stalemate in Turkey, 
EU relations, but it comes also from the sure. weaknesses of the EU in itself. Sure. That's a different uh, thing. Sure. Uh, Tahabi, uh, so you actually have three questions to you. One of them is, do you see a probability of changing Turkish position on Egypt under Sisi? Can the Libyan file result in a cooperative relationship or the current tension will continue? The first one. The second one is, is it in Turkey's strategic interest to strengthen the hand of Iran in its current standoff with the US? Or would it benefit more by Iran being compromised and exposed to foreign influence, especially in Iraq and Syria? And then the third question is, what is Turkey's new policy towards Iraq? And all of them are two, uh, two minutes, uh, 20 seconds. Great. What was the last one towards uh, Tur Turkey's? What is Turkey's policy at this stage towards Iraq, particularly after the new government? Like, okay. is there any change? Okay, okay. Uh, thank you, Galip, and thank you for the uh, questions. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try, I mean, as, uh, as much as possible to be uh, in a short answer. The, regarding the Sisi, if it was the unique issue of Sisi, there could be some alterations and some moves from both countries. And at least both countries could keep some back channels open and function, functioning. But the main problem with Egypt, quite bigger than the Sisi, even Ankara and Cairo would like to have some kind of cooperative relationship and advance their cooperation. Uh, whatever it is, not easy right now. Uh, the Sisi does not only represent uh, himself or Egypt. Right now, the bigger problem is Sisi is uh, being uh, a part of access, uh, which is directly uh, positioning against Turkey and any hope for changes in the Middle East, uh, which is an access of uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Emirates, uh, Gulf countries, Israel, and this is a bigger problem. And that problem is not surprisingly uh, having a, uh, clashes with, 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 with Turkey. No need to go back uh, what has happened. Uh, so even if Turkey wants to uh, advance their relationship, uh, right now there is a categorical uh, crisis uh, starting from uh, issues uh, in the region, uh, Eastern Mediterranean, uh, the Levant region. So this positioning, which uh, Sisi put Egypt into the axis, uh, is uh, continue to create problems between uh, between 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 two countries. And unless Egypt is uh, somehow at least uh, put uh, itself a little bit far away from this axis from Israel to Emirates, uh, I am not expecting anything uh, cooperatively uh, happening. And this is, by the way, a lose-lose case for both, both, both countries and for the region. Uh, the second question was about Iran. I don't see this issue is working in a, that black and white way. Uh, any existential problem regarding with Iran vis-a-vis uh, -vis United States uh, would create more problems than the current uh, status quo in the region. Yes, true, Iran is the, is the, is the, is the, uh, the biggest problem regarding Iraq and Syria. Uh, they are fanatically uh, sponsoring all the massacres and the problems in Iraq and Syria. But uh, this uh, cannot be uh, resettled uh, by U.S. Uh, current policy towards, towards Iran. And I'm not expecting Turkey uh, siding with, uh, blindly with U.S. policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Iranian issue. Uh, in fact, I mean, as it happened in uh, recent years, Turkey will try to mediate, if not, uh, they are not going to side uh, with United States like Gulf countries uh, against Iran. Again, uh, we have a very uh, long history and the border uh, with Iran and including Syria and Iraq. Uh, if you consider their penetration level, uh, it will directly uh, have negative impact on Turkey. So Turkey will keep uh, her position uh, as much as similar to recent years, although uh, they have uh, 
directly clashing with Iranian proxies in Syria, in a way also in the politics of Iraq. And Iraq, as I just uh, finished my sentence uh, with, uh, with, with, with regarding Iran, uh, same thing, I mean, happening. Uh, the Turkish involvement is structural one right now in Iraq, not, not only in Kurdistan region, but also uh, the Sunni actors of Baghdad uh, politics. Turkey plays a very vital role. Uh, but the, 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 the inconsistencies of the government uh, last uh, two years uh, is literally uh, not helping if any help could possibly go or channel from Ankara to, to Baghdad. I think it's quite early uh, to see if there will be a, a productive relationship or not. Uh, the one who left the government was uh, very uh, much uh, keen to Turkey and working with Ankara. Uh, he was a uh, also praised guy uh, by, by, by Ankara. But we will see. I think it's quite early to make any comment uh, to see if Ankara and Baghdad could work easily with this, with this government. Uh, Dr. Uh, Abdullah, uh, there are several questions to you as well too. I mean, the question that from uh, the topic that you have speaking. One of them is basically on the nature of Turkey-Qatar relation. So how do you explain or account for the uh, turkish Qatari relation. What is the nature of it? And secondly, uh, there is uh, Devon Hester. Basically, is that anyone who says that, you know, can balance Turkey in the Gulf region, given the Gulf states are very much bogged down in their own crisis? Uh, you're, please uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, I read these questions and thank you. Uh, the GCC crisis uh, catapulted, uh, uh, if you may, uh, the uh, Turkish uh, or solidified uh, the Turkish Qatari uh, alliance. Now it's becoming more strategic, uh, whether it's an investment, whether it's, I mean, even uh, uh, I think last week, President Erdogan in the midst of uh, COVID-19, it was very peculiar. He visited uh, Doha and he met with uh, uh, the Qatar, Qatari Emir, and that was a, a clarion message that even even though there is Corona virus, but that does not stop the you know the, the cooperation and even the visits uh, between these two heads of states. Uh, Qatar for sure bankrolls uh, uh, Turkey's investment, uh, huge investment. Uh, Qatar feels very appreciative of the uh, Turkish uh, role and its uh, speedy uh, sending uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a short notice uh, uh, Turkish troops. Uh, but that doesn't go beyond the bilateral relationship. Uh, I mean, we don't should should not read too much into. Uh, this strategic relationship because it's still uh, lonely. Uh, Turkey, Turkey is lonely in the in, uh, in the Gulf region, and uh, it's look, uh, looked upon in a very disparaging manner, as I said, from the other axis. Uh, and because of that, we see huge uh, and continuous campaign, anti-Turkish campaign that's really taking roots and spreading through bots and through uh, columns and. Uh, disparaging even President Erdogan personally uh, to create the persona or to create the image that Turkey is a, an imperial power, uh, the Ottomans are coming back, and uh, just to give a negative stereotype of Turkey, and they used every single uh, comment or, uh, or, or statement uh, by Erdogan or by uh, other uh, uh, in, in, in Turkish leadership to just uh, prove their points, and this is really becoming very uh, old hat. I mean, I mean, it's, it's worn out, but still, it resonates uh, among some circles uh, in the region. So, uh, so I think the longer the GCC crisis uh, lingers on, uh, the more uh, uh, you know embracing Qatar-Turkish relation, and there is also a movement by Turkey into Kuwait and Oman. So the, the, the split in the GCC, we have a three by three, 
you have uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, uh, Bahrain to a lesser extent uh, on one hand, and then you have uh, Qatar, uh, led by Qatar, uh, Kuwait, Oman on the other hand, which is which falls unfortunately into the axis rivalry. Uh, that's not healthy for us in the region, but the counterbalance is not available. I mean, we rely on the United States. The United States is having lesser footprint in the Middle East and the MENA region as a whole. Uh, the, the, the Turkish has a very ambitious and assertive uh, policy, but it does not resonate at, at this stage because uh, Turkey is look, uh, looked upon in some circles in the Arab world as an occupying power. Uh, let's be frank about it. They occupy a huge chunk of Syria. They want to prevent, but there are challenges for Turkish role and, and project, if you will. Uh, they don't see eye to eye uh, regarding Iran, with Iran and with Russia in Syria. Uh, in Iraq, uh, there is also the issue of uh, preventing the Kurds from having a statehood in northern Syria. There's a problem in, uh, in, in Idlib. But I will give a credit to, for Turkey uh, for uh, preventing a major massacre. I don't know how long uh, Turkey could really uh, withstand the assault in Idlib. Uh, they don't want to be another Halab, another Aleppo. And they have thus far, uh, with marginal success, uh, prevented a major massacre to take place. Uh, and that, and that's, uh, that goes for uh, Turkish credit and leadership. Uh, in Libya, there is a major problem here. I mean, they are now uh, mocking Turkey to try to dare to cross Sisi's red line. I mean, the, uh, the bots are challenging Gordogan. Let's see how, how heroic you are and go try to cross Sisi's red line in Jafra and insert. So, uh, so, I mean, it's a mixed bag here, if you will, regarding Turkey. Uh, but the challenges are there for Turkish project. Uh, Turkey has a lot of soft power and it's playing it very smartly, but this doesn't go far enough. Uh, in my opinion, I don't. Uh, I don't remember. What's the second question? Uh, basically, the second question was: uh, Is there a counterbalancer for Turkey in the region, uh, particularly from the Gulf states? The counterbalancer is to get our act together, <laughs> but that seems to be an Herculean uh, task. I mean, the GCC does not see eye to eye now regarding many issues, and one of them is Turkey. The other one is Iran. Uh, and the, the, the GCC crisis has really brought up to the surface sure. all our ills and all our dysfunctional uh, organization. But there is no counter, but of course, Iran is there and, and it's in our neighborhood more than Turkey is, but Iran also has a problem with its projection of sure. power, with its uh, sectarian. I mean, this is what's good. I, mean, I, I have to really to mention this. What's, what distinguishes the Iranian project from the Turkish project is that the Iranian project, and I'm very critical of the Iranian project uh, since day one, the Turkish project, although it is uh, stigmatized by Ikhwan, uh, uh, Muslim Brotherhood inclination, uh, but it does not really fester, it is not, it's, it, it's not very clear. Right. On the other right. hand, the Iranian project is completely a sectarian one, propping up the Shia, uh, Shia militarization in Syria, in Iraq, in Lebanon. It's not looked as if as an embracing uh, project. The other point is that Turkey represents a very good model for Muslim countries to mix liberalism with Islamism, with a successful uh, economic model. And I remember the American, uh, scholars and even administration have been always touting and uh, bringing up as a successful Muslim uh, model. Right. Always mm -hmm. they speak about Turkey and Indonesia and Malaysia. And not all mm -hmm. Muslim countries or not all, all Muslim models are bad or failure. Look at Turkey. Right. Turkey now is, 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 is coming very strong. It's a member of the G20. It has the 18th largest economy. Right. It's a member of NATO. You have all of this. So Turkey has a lot of a, a lot of leverage, Thank you very today, much. but it has really to, sure. to try to, to understand the dynamics and the divergence sure. issues and the other the collect, clashing projects 
that will hinder and challenge Turkey's uh, project in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Marwan, uh, basically there are a few questions on Russia and I Russia, Turkey, Iran, Turkey relations. Uh, when you look at from Syria, do you see any major changes to the dynamics between Turkey, Iran, and Russia? Or do you see more or less what we see thus far will continue for another one or two years? Well, uh, of course, I believe that Russia uh, has established itself over the past few years since the military intervention in 2015 as the major actor in Syrian, in Syrian politics both on the, on the ground and also on the table of negotiations. And the Russians have been very good actually in mastering their relationship with the major actors on the Syrian conflict, i.e. I'm talking here about Turkey, Iran, and Israel. Also, of course, I mean, you can always uh, add the United States. Um, uh, uh, so I think uh, uh, the Russians here are, are the, major, the major player. Of course, I mean, the Russians are, when they, this is, what, this is when I think they are mastering their relationship very good with the other, with the other powers, because when they need uh, to have uh, a military offensive against the opposition, they rely more on Iran. When they want to go to the table of negotiations, they rely more on Turkey. When they want actually to limit Iranian influence in Syria, they allow the Israelis to bomb the Iranians. So they have been managing the relationship between these different powers in a very, very good way. So now, when we talk about um, the relationship between uh, uh, Turkey, Iran, and uh, Turkey, Russia, uh, now Iran, this is what I see, is in a weaker position compared, let's say, to Iran uh, a couple of years ago, or Iran under uh, uh, Obama, the Obama administration, because there has been a lot of pressure uh, on Iran by this administration, the, the Trump administration. Um, so I think the Iranians are in a much weaker position today in Syria and in other places in the Middle East, including in Iraq. And uh, uh, the, 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 the reason I'm saying this, uh, 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 there is a prime minister in Iraq today that is not really picked up by Iran. I'm talking here about Mustafa uh, Kazani. The Iranians, they, they just don't like the guy. And the guy he's trying um, over the past couple of weeks, actually, to, uh, to limit the influence of Iran uh, uh, by cracking down at the uh, Iran-backed uh, Iran militias. Also in Syria, we have seen Iran actually weakening a lot because the Russians are uh, having their differences with the Iranians. And as I said, I mean, the, the Israelis since last April, actually, they have been very active in attacking Iranian targets sure. in Syria. And that was why the Iranian uh, uh, defense minister was, or, or the chief of staff was in Syria last week, and he he signed this agreement to the to to, to boost the, the 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 air defenses of the Syrian regime because they can no longer actually rely on Russia. Russia sure. is allowing the Israelis to bomb the Iranians. Thank in, you. In Thank you, Tariq. Last question to you, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, basically, there are like two questions. One of them is how Turkish. Uh, French tension will affect uh, Libya. And secondly, there was one on the approval rating, uh, a question that uh, basically says that the approval rating of the GNA is quite low compared to LNA uh, within the public uh, on by, the, by the Libyans. So overall, how the public perception, Libyan public perception vis-a-vis -vis Turkey in Libya? And please confine to two minutes and then we'll close it down. Well, thank you for bookending this excellent session with me um, on both sides. I feel honored. Um, on the the question of public perception, I mean, these like, it's, it's very difficult to conduct accurate polling in Libya these days for a number of reasons. Um, the few polls that have come out, they have their flaws, but the the way that this particular fact is is twisted is to take an answer that says how much support do you have for an army or is spinning it as a national security institution uh, which tends to come out as quite high if you reframe the question in some of these polls um, as to you know how much support do you have for for the eastern government the parliament and the different political entities one thing you have in common is that you see that everybody's popularity is low um, and to, to kind of build on that question, the only way that any entity in Libya will actually become popular is to start governing. 
Um, and this is one of the big challenges that Turkey has in its partnership with the GNA, that the GNA will have to will 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 have to earn its legitimacy by trying to govern. Um, and Turkey are going to have to help them to to do that. Um, the LNA has always had a a very kind of fickle support base, um, and many of its you know it calls itself an army, but it's it's really just a coalition of different self-interest Libyan groups, uh, which have mainly gone their own way now. So we'll see how this how this issue progresses. Um, but this question on on Turkey France is I think going to be a defining question at least over the next few months. I mean, it's one that inextricably ties together uh, the East Med and Libya. Um, it's one that makes the European role on Libya more difficult. Um, and given that the Europeans are the self-declared referees or, uh, or arbiters in Libya, um, it means that there's actually nobody filling that, that normative role in the middle, you know, somebody calling for accountability, for respect for human rights, for a respect for the UN process, uh, because of this European need um, to, to mollify France and to ensure that, you know, France is, is, is content. Um, and I don't see how this issue is going to be resolved because it's essentially a, a head-on disagreement between two presidential systems with two very headstrong presidents. Um, so I end thank you. on a pessimistic note again. Sorry, my friend. No, th thank you very, very much. It has been a great discussion. I myself learned a lot from it and it also reflected basically the contentious nature of, or at least like disputed nature of uh, Turkey's regional policy as well too, like, you know, different places, different approaches. Uh, and I'm sure going forward, this uh, topic, this file, Turkey's regional policy, will continue to generate uh, both, you know, sport, opposition, interest, uh, controversies, and hopefully in Brookings, how we will try to keep up with this debate as much as possible. So please uh, continue to follow our other event at Brookings, how the webinars. And once again, I would like to thank all of the speakers and all of the participants uh, for this great debate. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.